Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Oxford Martin School. And today we have a seminar on new and novel technologies for vaccine delivery. We've got two speakers. Um, we have Christine Rollier, who is a general investigator at the Oxford Vaccine Group um, in the Department of Pediatrics. She was a James Martin Fellow at the, um, on the Oxford Martin Programme on Vaccines, which is a five-year programme established here at the Oxford Martin School. Um, to design and develop new vaccines against infectious diseases of global health importance. And she's now working on vaccine development against encapsulated bacteria and pediatric infectious diseases. So Christine's going to speak for about 45 minutes, and then we will hear from Pawel Dulal, who is a researcher in the Vaccine Delivery Technologies Group at the Jenner Institute. Um, his work focuses on the development of heat-stable vaccines for efficient distribution in the developing world. Um, and he will speak for probably about 10, 15 minutes, and then we will have time for questions. So if you could probably um, best to hold questions for Christine until after both have spoken, um, and then we can have a good conversation after that. So I'll hand over to Christine. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to, to present this, this work, which was um, essentially a collaboration yeah, with the uh, engineering and the Oxford Vaccine Group in Pediatrics Department and was funded by the Oxford Martin School. So, first I'll set the scene. So every year, uh, vaccines save um, more or less 2.5 million lives worldwide. Most of the 800 million vaccine injections that are given per year are done by liquid antigen by intramuscular uh, or subcutaneous needle and syringe injection. There are many disadvantages in using this technology. Uh, first one is the risk of transmission of blood-borne viruses like HIV, HBV, and HCV, maybe Zika now. Uh, safe disposal of needles, and uh, there's no reuse possibility. There's a need for cold chain uh, uh, for refrigeration of the liquid vaccines, and that's of course is in common with uh, uh, Pawan's talk about thermostability. That is a huge cost actually. Um, multiple doses are typically required to provide protection, and that also adds to the cost of vaccine and to, to the difficulty of getting infants uh, the, the, the full uh, schedule. And uh, to a lesser extent, compliance, I'm trying to picture here some uh, needle phobia that I might have, oh, some of us might have. Some numbers to back up uh, what I'm, uh, my point here is uh, the WHO estimates that there are uh, 30 million needle stick injuries per year. Um, that is not only vaccine injections, I have to, to, to say. Uh, it, the WHO also estimates that there is 84% of healthcare workers that will experience a needle stick injury every year. And that is really, for, for me, that is a shockingly very high number of needle stick injuries. And again, I have to, to make a precision that it's not only vaccines. Um, in USM or, or any US or UK toddler by 18 months will have received more or less 10 inoculations with a, a, a needle uh, in, uh, by 18 months in their life. And in the uh, developing world, it has been estimated again by the WHO or the CDC that 50% of in injections give rise annually to 21 million new cases of Hep B, 2 million new cases of Hep C, and 260,000 new cases of HIV. Uh, and I mentioned again the cold chain for storage and transport of vaccine. It cost, uh, it was estimated uh, uh, 200 to 300 uh, dollars, million dollars annually, and of course increases the, the, the vaccine price. So I, I think this, this number speaks for themselves that uh, maybe there's a need to enhance the public health impact of immunization. How can we do that? What technology uh, can we expect in the future? I think that that's what the Oxford Martin asked me to talk about, and I'll, I'll try to answer a little bit about it. Uh, first, I want to mention that um, availability of needle-free alternatives to hypodermic needles, and preferably in thermostable form, have been named the two scientific and technological innovations that would remove a critical barrier to solving an important health problem. Here, this, this sentence is not from me, it's from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So they estimate that these two have a, a high likelihood of global impact and feasibility. So uh, the thermostable aspect here will be uh, discussed by, by Pawan after my talk. So I'll concentrate on the needle-free. And the first thing I want to clarify here uh, for you is 
uh, what do I mean by needle free? The first thing that should come into the mind of any vaccinologist or immunologist is mucosal delivery, def definitely needle free. So what do we mean by mucosal delivery? So delivery in the, in the mouth, in the nose. First, it's very relevant. Most pathogens invade the organism via the mucosal surfaces. Um, this delivery has a very good patient compliance and ease of access. For example, the oral polio, you give a few drops in the mouth, perfect. Every mom is happy with that rather than an injection and their baby cries. The delivery de device are very cheap, especially, for example, for oral polio, and can be simple. Uh, for flu, for example, the nasal delivery works very well. Uh, not as cheap as the oral, but, but not bad. Uh, and of course, there are uh, success stories for, for mucosal delivery, the oral polio I mentioned. There was also a success story with the pulmonary measles vaccine and, and flu. There are barriers to mucosal vaccine delivery, and very important barriers, and which are uh, real challenges for immunologists and vaccinologists. First, the poss possibility, um, the, the, the capacity of the mucosal barrier to inactivate the antigen, to inactivate the immunogen by secretory antibodies, by enzymes, by uh, dilution, for example, in the saliva, and then you would follow it. Uh, delivering in the mouth mucosa is not the same as delivering in the gut. Um, uh, excretion by the mucus. So you need actually a high dose of antigen or a live uh, vaccine. Uh, you, or you need an adjuvantation, for example, with cholera toxin or heat label, label enterotoxin mutant of E. coli, and these have potential side effects and difficulties. Uh, there's potential interference with concomitant infections, like uh, uh, or the microbiota. There is a huge interest at the moment in immunology with, uh, uh, with the microbiota, um, uh, because uh, it's now clearly established that the microbiota of each person can influence the immune response to an immunogen, influence the immune response to whatever is, is then exposed on the, on the microbiota. Microbiota differ from per person to person, differ, differ in different countries, so that poses a, a really challenging problem for vaccinologists. Now also, if you think of pulmonary or urogenital delivery, uh, you can forget the patient compliance and the device uh, cheap and easy, because obviously then it's, it's a relatively different delivery. And the most important barrier for immunologists is that the uh, mucosal delivery can induce tolerance. And in that context, the room for error in the formulation of the antigen in terms of dose of the antigen and in terms of adjuvantation is very small. In addition, the mucosal delivery is actually not new. So uh, for all these reasons, I don't include it in a needle-free uh, uh, talk, and I'm not going to talk about it to, in, in this presentation, but I just w wanted to mention it because it's really an area of strong interest at the moment for immunologists and vaccinologists. So alternative vaccine delivery, what's available or what's in the pipe pipeline? So what I'm going to uh, show you briefly, because I don't talk, uh, work on it, so it's not my specialty, are the topical ap applications, uh, which are called transcutaneous or percutaneous, plus minus ultrasound. I'm going to talk about the microneedles, uh, whether they are solid, dissolvable, coated, or hollow. And then I'm going to focus on the uh, liquid jet injection, and more importantly, the ballistic powder injection, which is the one I worked on. And then I'm going to present the results we obtained from the Oxford Martin grant. Right? So topical application, what do I mean by that? Basically, it's a cream. You apply on your skin, and that's it. You would be vaccinated. I think it sounds quite good. In practice, there's difficulty. In practice, the antigen has to travel through the skin barrier. And for those of you, yeah, you, you all know your skin, you have your stratum corneum. It's lipid rich. It's a very, very efficient barrier against pathogen. And it's actually in a very, very efficient barrier against the vaccine as well. Uh, in addition, in, in vaccinology, uh, not only you need the antigen, but you also need a danger signal to induce, to, to, to let the immune the system know that there is something that they should should uh, respond to. And something as, as innocuous as a cream might not give the danger signal, and you have to bring it with an adjuvant. So that leads me to, to, to mention then the area of research currently from, from vaccinologists working on topical applications of vaccine. Basically, they work either on the um, formulation of the vaccine, uh, whether it's lipid-based uh, vaccine, emulsions vaccine, so that they actually go through the lipid-rich uh, barrier of the skin. And um, uh, that, that's one thing. 
and the second one, and also deliver the danger signal. And the second one is uh, preparing the skin or sensitizing the skin so that the antigen goes through it. And uh, uh, researchers are then uh, working on, for example, light abrasion by tape uh, stripping. For example, it's like a sticky tape you would put on your skin, take it a few times, and you actually damage very slightly the top of the skin, relatively pain-free. You all took a plaster off your, your, your skin uh, once in your life. Uh, and it damaged sufficiently that the antigen can then penetrate into the dermis, uh, or the epidermis and, and, and induce a response. And, and there's also work uh, going on on uh, laser microporation, but immediately you can see the difficulty here. We, we, we're talking about devices that are getting Im immediately more complicated. It included, includes a laser. The, the cost and the delivery system are getting immediately a bit more complicated. And, um, for developing country, you have to think that that might be a, a showstopper. Nevertheless, uh, there have been uh, studies showing in preclinical settings comparable or better efficacy, uh, uh, in particular with the inactivated flu vaccine in a dry form, in a dry patch. Uh, this was published in uh, 2008. So, topical application, the other aspects that could make it actually uh, uh, work or could, could help it to induce strong immune response is ultrasound. And there is a group at, uh, at the engineering department in IBME working on that. Uh, so as I said, the problem is to get sufficient amount of the antigen to pass the barrier. And uh, uh, this group has worked on low frequency ultrasounds used as a sort of physical adjuvant rather than a chemical adjuvant as typically used in a vaccine uh, to allow the transdermal delivery of the antigen. So. Um, this group here, uh, Kessel et al, in, in 2005 published a study where they used tetanus toxoid, so basically the tetanus vaccine, and they used ultrasound to enhance the delivery of uh, uh, vaccine into the skin. In that study, they didn't use any adjuvant, and they showed that the tetanus toxoid uh, was uh, delivered into the dermis, which, uh, epidermis, which was very good, and they also showed that uh, the ultrasound activated the local immune cells, so gave a bit the danger signal that the immune system needs to, to, to induce a response. So that was uh, a quite interesting study. There was another study where they, uh, the group of Ernest Hall showed that uh, an enhanced DNA vaccination by um, improving cell transfection. So DNA vaccines, basically, you don't have the protein antigen in the vaccine, you only have the, the plasmid code, coding for it. So it is really important that the plasmid gets into the cell. And the ultrasound did in, improve that, um, uh, that possibility, and the antibody, the immune response was good. Uh, there are problems with that technology. This technology is far from reaching, I think, uh, uh, real lives and, and real babies. The cost of the equipment, do you imagine having an ultrasound machine even as small as we can make it in developing countries? That could be uh, uh, really an issue. So the cost of the, equip uh, of the equipment and, uh, for example, uh, things uh, to, to be solved by the application time. So as much as I like this study, uh, I have to explain that they shape the mice they then apply the ultrasounds for uh, not so long the ultra on the skin, and then apply the vaccine and left it for two hours. So obviously you can see that that is not a possibility for vaccine. So, so this is an interesting technology, and I wanted to mention it, but it's not a technology that is uh, in a real life sort of uh, technology yet, and there's lots of work to, to be done on it. Right. Next one uh, I want to mention is the uh, microneedle patch. So, obviously, the first thing you may think is uh, she's trying to talk about needle-free delivery and it's microneedle. Uh, microneedle are not needles like you imagine. So, if you look at this picture, and I'm sorry for people on, on the left, the first picture here, uh, top left, you can see um, uh, this is taken from, from a published paper. You can see this is a syringe, right? I hope you can see the syringe. And this is a microneedle patch. So I think you, you agree with me that a microneedle is not a needle. It's a very much smaller than the needle that would be used to immunize a baby. So these uh, microneedles are maximum uh, in, in the range of 100 micrometer size. So they actually go into the epidermis, but no further. And they don't go where there is vasculature, vasculature and there is uh, less nerve sensing in that area. So, it's called microneedle, but it is considered a needle-free approach, really. Uh, this is a, 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 a higher-resolution picture, and you can see 
the microneedle uh, aligned on the patch. So the patch, uh, I should have brought one actually, the other side, let's say, of the tip of a finger like this. So you could imma imagine that that could be quite handy, uh, not only for immunizing yourself, you take the patch, put it, whatever the time for, for, for having the vaccine applied, if the prescription is one hour, two hours, I think it's probably relatively easy. And there is a massive advantage as well, is the, the packaging space. The, the packaging would be really, really small, and um, I'll mention in my discussion a bit later, but that is a massive advantage for, for vaccine delivery. Uh, because basically the storage costs a lot of money. So antigen is delivered to the, anti the antigen-presenting cells in the uh, uh, dermis and epidermis, APCs, under the skin. And uh, here I cite uh, three studies um, uh, here where people have compared the patch either to intradermal delivery or subcutaneous del delivery or intramuscular de delivery for different vaccines. So one is a, a adenovirus-based malaria, the other is a measles vaccine where they use a fifth of the dose uh, to compare with the patch. The, the last one is a flu vaccine. And in, in all these studies, they had very good immune responses against this vaccine. However, I have to say, this is in preclinical setting. This is in animal models. This is not in humans. So quite, a, quite a good antibody responses uh, here. I want to focus a, a, a little more in detail in one study done by uh, Frances Pearson uh, and, and colleagues. Uh, Frances used to work at the Jenner and then now is in, is in uh, Australia. And she, they published uh, just last year this very interesting study where they used um, uh, a real, uh, real life vaccine delivered by the patch. And I think that is quite interesting in, in, in this new vaccine we uh, have to use uh, already existing vaccines to, to demonstrate the, the, the capacity of this technology. So she used a pneumococcal vaccine it's called PCV7. It's uh, uh, delivered by Pfizer. Um, and she showed by, that she could induce functional antibodies in mice, admittedly, against uh, PCV7 in a dry form. So has two advantage here, the needle-free patch, small, small um, packaging, and dry which means uh, thermostable. So, so quite some advantages in that study. So here, uh, uh, two pictures taken from her, uh, from her paper that is cited here. Here you can see the, uh, the patch coated with the vaccine without the alum. They took out the, the adjuvant in that vaccine. And, and here on this graph, you can see uh, some uh, antibody um, uh, levels in the mice immunized with the, the PCV7 with the patch, with or without alum, and you can see that in both cases, even without adjuvant, the antibody response was higher than the one obtained, uh, and I can come on the, the other side, when, than the one obtained here uh, with the intramuscular immunization. So a very promising technology that is in development, these, these patches, a very small packaging, and potentially possibility to self-vaccinate that has some implication ethically and societal, but we can talk about in the discussion. So next is the liquid jet injection. What is it? The liquid jet injection is taking your vaccine as a liquid and pushing it through the skin with a high pressure, right? So here is a very nice drawing taken from that uh, review from Patrick Aital, and I recommend that review for, for those who are interested in, in liquid jet. It's a really good review. Um, obviously, the device is different to the needle. So on that picture, you can see on the left, this is a needle. Uh, uh, or a drawing of what a needle delivery should do uh, uh, intradermally. So you can see the drop here and the, the cells are pushed. And the liquid jet is sort of, of thought to um, disperse better the liquid into the tissue so that you, you touch a lot more anti antigen-presenting cells. You target more antigen-presenting cells and that could induce a better immune response. Uh, yeah, this is yeah, the skin and then here the epidermis. So, quite some advantages poten potentially here, and a lot of work already. So, it requires well-designed equipment because you have to have the right pressure to push the liquid in a very fine nozzle um, through the stratum corneum and into the epidermis. And actually, you have a, a liquid jet injection up, uh, that can deliver into the muscle. So, so that is quite some, some pressure applied here. So, the um, equipment is similar to the ballistic powdered injection that I'm that was presented at the last. Basically, you need for the new equipment, uh, new materials that are pharma pharmacologically inert. Obviously, they will touch the skin of everybody we vaccinate. 
They have to resist high temperature because you want to uh, sterilize them. They have to be strong. You have the, the, the gas. You have to deliver the gas within the device to push the liquid. So it has to be uh, uh, strong and lightweight. So for that, the plastics are the best, uh, polycarbonate and all these uh, sort of things. Assembly has to be done in aseptic condition. The pressure, sh the pressure sh source is um, compressed gas in a vessel included in the device, and uh, which is released in, in a, a very high velocity and very short timing, a microsecond, uh, at the time of injection. The gas can be air, CO2, nitrogen, or helium. This in itself is not so much of a problem, but you can see that uh, for vaccines, liquid vaccine that already exist, there's already is a problem for, for let's say if, we say, if we think that technique is good, there's a problem into um, implementing in real life. And what's the problem? Is that all these vaccines have plants and, and uh, uh, production design already made. These vaccines are, are designed in massive plants, in massive quantities, with, with the very uh, defined conditions. And if you wanted to integrate them in this liquid jet injector, then it's a huge investment for, for a company to actually um, uh, create the device, or even if it's already created, to act actually assemble, rather than putting the vaccine into the vials as, ev uh, as they all do, to assemble, or to in the syringe already, to assemble it within the device in a septic condition. This is, we, we, we're talking millions and millions of pounds here of reinvesting in the technology, in the plants, and so on. And uh, I wanted to mention that because this is really, and I think it's the same for thermostability, and Pawan will comment on it, but this is uh, what is really stopping this technology to come in real life, is the fact that the exi for existing vaccine, the, the production already exists, and people are not ready to change them because of the price it costs. Anyway, it's a fantastic technology. <laughs> Several devices already uh, exist for that. You have, I cite a few here, the Jupiter Jet for small volumes of liquid injected intradermal or, or intramuscular, Biojet Zeta Jet for up to uh, half an ml. Uh, uh, this one is interesting because it already has uh, the American uh, Food and Drug Administration clearance for a vaccine and other uh, injected medication. It's a single use, it's a bit ex expensive. The Biojector 2000, it's sing single use syringes. That means that the, uh, the, the mechanism to deliver the vaccine it can be reused, but you have to just change the syringe containing the vaccine, which is potentially quite, uh, quite clever. I cite here a few names of company just for, for a bit of equity here. And all of these can be found in that review that I mentioned. So in terms of application, actually, uh, while the title of my talk is New and Novel Delivery, uh, this one is not so novel, actually. The liquid jet injector were developed in the 1930s and used for human mass vaccination campaigns against measles, polio, smallpox, and HPV from the 1950s to the 1980s uh, with reusable devices that would not be accepted nowadays. Um, the, here I cite, I think, uh, yes, three or four uh, uh, studies where it's been shown that the liquid gen injector induces variable antibody response after intramuscular or subcutaneous, uh, as compared as intramuscular and subcutaneous injections. So in some cases, it induces higher response than the conventional uh, delivery. So there's a HEP A uh, study that I cite here, and a flu study in, uh, um, a lot more recently, published in the Lancet uh, two years ago. But actually, it's not always the case. Sometimes the liquid jet injector uh, does not induce a high enough immune response. It was uh, tested for DNA vaccines, uh, and it induced very good immunogenicity in preclinical pre uh, studies with HIV and uh, with malaria. Uh, with the malaria vaccine in pig, uh, uh, adenovirus-based vaccine, it actually induced a lower immune response. That is one of the examples uh, where, where the response is, is, is lower. So there's still some work to, to be done here in the, con in the concept of how much you deliver, where you deliver, which, which tissue is exactly targeted. But I just want to mention that this technology is already, is, is, is actually cur currently in use in humans for insulin and for recombinant human growth hormone. And the side effect reported as occasional pain and bleeding, obviously because this is pushed at such a pressure in, in, the, in the skin or the muscle. Very good technology. However, of course, my preferred one, and the one I worked on, is the ballistic powdered injection, or otherwise called intradermal powder injection. And the main difference with the liquid jet injection is basically that it is a dried vaccine coated onto uh, beads or, or uh, particles. 
The aim is the same as the liquid jet injection, is to deliver, and, and the microneedle patch, is to deliver into the epidermal layer of the skin, which is rich in antigen-presenting cells. And in addition, uh, the beads, depending on their size, could deliver the uh, vaccine directly in the cytoplasm of the cells and then uh, uh, thus induce a very good uh, presentation of the antigen. So what's the target site? Maybe I should have presented that at the beginning of the talk. This is a um, uh, microscopy of the uh, uh, skin tissue. You can see the stratum corneum here, 10, 20 micrometers, uh, uh, epidermal cell. And here, the epidermis, that's the one we target in, in that, uh, with the particle delivery. It's important to know that actually the skin's mechanical resistance to penetration varies with age, varies with ethnicity, with injection site in the body, with the gender, even with the relative humidity in the room, and uh, with the ambient temperature. So this complicates quite a lot the standardization of the equipment needed to deliver a vaccine at the right dose and at the right place in the tissue, as you can imagine. However, it's not uh, insurmountable. Uh, the advantage, obviously, as I mentioned already for uh, epidemic delivery, no vasculator, so you should not be bleeding when you receive that vaccine, and a low, very low density of sensory nerve ending, so less pain. Design of the vaccine and the device, uh, uh, many physical parameters can be uh, uh, um, worked on here. So for breaching the stratum corneum, uh, uh, this is a function of the particle density, the particle size, and uh, the, which then you can play on in your vaccine preparation, and also the velocity, which is the pressure applied to the, to the coated dried be uh, beads, and also a uh, function of the, the size of your nozzle uh, uh, to apply to the skin. We obviously want to reach the right uh, depth, and, and I'll tell you why uh, there's an example in, in human where, where human had side effects because it went too fast, too far. Uh, and for that, we need robust particles. They should not just disintegrate when they touch the skin. They have to penetrate through the stratum corneum and some other cells. Uh, we need to work, we can work on their size, and th whether they're big or small will influence how far they go into the epidemics. If they're too small, they might not penetrate at all. If they're too big, they might go too far because they acquire too much velocity. So, uh, um, and the density as well can be worked on. All these parameters have been the object of many studies. So actually, a lot of these parameters are already known for, for uh, ballistic uh, uh, delivery. Uh, and especially there's this review by, uh, by uh, my, my colleague Nicolas Weissmuller, published in 2013. And these two papers here, a bit old admittedly, but very thorough and, and very nicely done by uh, Quinlan et al. in 2001 and Kendall et al. in 2004. And there's a, many other studies from the same authors. So these people have worked on the, the particle size. For example, 100, less than 100 micrometer diameter is reported pain-free. So really, we are in the range of the, of the uh, ballistic injection. All of uh, uh, our uh, particles are in the range of 20 micrometers. Uh, several particle size were tested uh, and velocity from, uh, from the nano, nanoparticles in, in uh, in nanometer sizes to, to up to 50 micrometers uh, by these people. The amounts that can be delivered in one shot of the vaccine can be up to one or two milligram of the powder, uh, and, and there's still no bleeding with that, and that is well within the range that we need for vaccine. So, so all of that is, is quite sorted, actually, already. So a brief history. Uh, uh, Flu vaccine, an inactivated flu vaccine, that was the first study in 2000, so new technology, but okay, already 16 years old. Uh, Chen et al. showed for the first time with an inactive flu vaccine and in mice that uh, a rigid dose given by ballistic intradermal uh, injection induced comparable antibody response as uh, compared to a subcutaneous injection of the flu vaccine, and it actually induced a better protection. In, in the mice model. Uh, this study was followed by several studies that, that uh, would be too long to cite from 2000 to 2004, uh, in, uh, all in preclinical settings, obviously different animal models with hepatitis B, diphtheria, tetanostoxoid, HIV envelope, equine herpes viruses, with or re without adjuvants, with quite some uh, uh, good, good results. I want to mention one clinical trial with a flu vaccine that was performed or published in 2004 
where the flu vaccine given with the uh, uh, powdered injection induced similar antibody titers to intramuscular injection, although the seroprotection was somewhat lower. And why is that study, uh, I think, particularly important? It's because uh, this study showed the side effects that could be observed in humans with using the, the uh, powdered delivery. So what, what did they report? In not all cases, but in some cases, self-limiting mild to mod moderate erythema, local erythema, edema, edema uh, local, uh, some petechia, slight skin discoloration, and uh, rarely a mild bleeding and pain. So overall, it could be considered relatively uh, safe and or totally acceptable side effects, but actually it very strongly suggests now that the particles have penetrated too deep uh, into the skin and not exactly where we want them to, to, to penetrate. Because when you penetrate into the epidermis and not lower, you shouldn't get the petechiae. So actually, since 2004, we have evolved quite well and developed uh, powdered immunization that do not induce, at least in animals, we can't say about the, too much about the pain, but do not induce uh, uh, petechiae or edema or even any erythema. So, I want to give it to, to my colleagues in the engineering department in IBME that they did work for the, the work that was funded by the Oxford Martin School. They worked out uh, a lot of aspects, the technical and engineering aspects of the vaccine powdered immunization. Uh, they worked on the um, vaccine formulation in order to stabilize the vaccine in the particle pools. This is quite a challenge. Uh, similar processes are involved in the thermostable uh, uh, vaccine, so I, uh, Pawan will touch on that, and I don't want to go into technical details, which in, in addition I would not be an expert on. There's also uh, the drying process is, is a very tricky moment in, in, in that work because you have to dry the vaccine onto the particle and it has to retain its immunogenicity, its integrity uh, when uh, you, you uh, inject in, in, in your target, basically. Same battle as for thermostable vaccine, so I'm, I'm not going into detail into that. And then there's a lot of work that can be done on the particles carrying the vaccine. So in the past, it was essentially gold particle, uh, uh, nowadays uh, mineral particles, where you can load one to 25 micrograms of antigen per injection, which is exactly in the range of, of more or less any vaccine. Uh, you can modify the surface characteristics of your particles so that you actually modify the antigen uh, uh, release kinetic. And IBME was looking into, uh, uh, for example, a sustain or prolonged or a peak uh, release or completely novel a pulsatile release that would be absolutely fantastic if we could make that happen because pulsatile release could mean that in one injection you could have the prime and the boost a couple of weeks later and that's uh, almost every vaccine it requires a prime and a boost, at least a non-live vaccine, and having that in one injection would be, uh, I can tell you, a revolution. But we're not there yet, but they're working on it. They can also optimize the, the surface uh, adsorption and the morphology of the particle to make them go in the right place in the tissue. Right. So a bit more de uh, detail on that study that uh, we conducted with them. We use the diphtheria toxin mutant CREM uh, 197 protein. It's a protein that's frequently used uh, in the vaccine against uh, pneumococcus uh, uh, and uh, meningococcus uh, in these commercial uh, vaccines because uh, these vaccines uh, are based on the sugar um, uh, moiety of the bacteria, the polysaccharide. It's not very immunogenic on its own. So what, what we do is that we conjugate to a protein carrier and then the vaccine becomes immunogenic even in infants. So we thought that was a good model antigen to use. And we reported that the use of needle-free ballistic intradermal immunization with this protein uh, uh, with a ma microparticle made of a mineral which is called hydroxyapatite, it's a, um, a calcium mineral. <coughs> so same, same picture I showed you previously, but actually, so this is a drawing showing you where we hope the, the particles go. Actually, this is not to scale because the particles are a lot smaller. And actually, in this picture, the arrow here points to where the particles are in the skins. These are the particles we worked on. So you can see so, some of them are lost here. They are on top of the stratum corneum. They didn't get in. And some, are, some of them are, are, are in here, exactly where we want them to be. So not too bad. Not perfect, but not too bad. Right. So we did a lot of these studies in, in, in the skin to, 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 calculate, to, to identify in the mouse model where was the best place to immunize. And this then should be done in human as well. And uh, here you find the example of what we tested. So 
that's the size of the epidermis, size of the stratum corneum, and you can see that depending on the, where you are, uh, this size changes, and this is the particle penetration depth, and we thought that this was the best here uh, in the Iapina, 53 micrometer, perfectly in the middle of the epidermis, perfect location. We determine the optimal particle absorption and morphology of the particle. So uh, here, for example, uh, you can see the, the particles, the hydroxyhepatite particles and uh, potassium dose particles. So just the uh, addition of the potassium, you can see, increases the absorption of the vaccine on the particles. So obviously we went for this uh, uh, formulation. These are um, uh, electron microscopy pictures of the particle showing their size. This is around the 20 micrometer size. Um, uh, in both cases, they pretty much look the same. They are not all uh, uh, spheroids. Some of them are a bit prismic and so, but we noticed that it didn't change the absorption capacity, whether they were not round or, or, or not. But we went for this one anyway. This graph shows the absorption. The higher the concentration of antigen, obviously, the higher the absorption on the particles. And this one shows the release of the antigen. Uh, obviously, that's, not, that's in vitro. And uh, you can see the, the, a lot of the release is done uh, relatively quickly in, in, a few, in minutes after the, after the um, injection. It is, very, as I mentioned, very important to verify that the uh, protein, the antigen, retains the secondary and tertiary structure uh, after being dried on the particle when it's then re put uh, again into solution. And this table shows that we achieved that. Here is our vaccine with that uh, uh, blue arrow. And you can see that uh, uh, K-hat, it's called here. And uh, you can see the alpha helix context, beta sheet, and amide uh, peak are really similar to the uh, uh, protein in solution. And here is a comparison with the protein in the alum, how it's presented normally in the vaccine. And you can think that, if anything, we are closer to the solution than, than the alum is. Uh, so, so all of this is very good, and we went to an, an in vivo evaluation of the vaccine in mice. So groups of mice were immunized with the needle-free vaccine and compared with the uh, uh, conventional immunization uh, with, uh, uh, with alum. And on the top uh, graph, you can see the antibody response against the uh, creme protein. After one dose here and after two dose here, in gray is, uh, I think, is the uh, with alum, creme with alum, and in black, the needle-free <laughs> delivery. And I can see, uh, I, I hope you agree with me that after one dose or two dose, um, uh, the needle-free vaccine induces an antibody response that's very similar to the one induced uh, by uh, uh, intramuscular injection with the adjuvant. I have to mention that in addition, this one contains no adjuvant. So if you want to compare with the in injection with no adjuvant, this is the white bar here, no adjuvant, no adjuvant here, but in the right tissue, you can see the dramatic effect it can have. Um, the quality of the antibodies was the same between alum and uh, uh, particles, um, as measured by the IgG1, IgG2A bal balance. So that is all very nice. Five minutes, thank you. That is all very nice, but actually it's a non-existing vaccine. The protein is never given alone. So um, uh, because of the success, we decided to try with an existing vaccine. We took a, a meningococcal vaccine from uh, Novartis. It's a meningococcal Y vaccine. We call it here uh, uh, Creme Men Y. This is one probably given in the UK, I assume, the Men Y vaccine. No, not all three, but it's, it's very widely used. For this, uh, uh, the engineering department developed nanoparticles, um, reacted them with the vaccine, uh, and did a lot of controls that maybe I should not show for the sake of time, but uh, uh, protein loading, uh, the size of the particle was controlled, the physical properties of the particle, the residual moisture, glass transition temperature, etc. The concentration of the vaccine of the particles, it represents 13% of the weight of vaccine uh, of the total weight re relative to particle mass. This is the fun pictures. I hope, I hope you like it. I, I absolutely love these pictures. These are actually the particles that we obtain. Particles alone and then loaded with particles. You can see it makes no difference. The particle integrity is conserved. This is uh, electron microscopy at different uh, uh, enlargement. And so on, on the top, no, bottom left, <laughs> hopefully, you can see uh, uh, the, the best picture of the particles and the surface that is, is not smooth and that is good because a non-smooth means that you can absorb a lot more protein onto it rather than a smooth, and more or less, more or less roundish, very cool, anyway. 
all the measurements were good. So we went for the immunogenesis study, again, in, in, in mice. Mice were immunized at zero and 28 days with uh, 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 five mic microgram dose of the NANY uh, polysaccharides with corresponds to eight microgram of the protein. And in that particular case, because this is a real vaccine, uh, we could measure the functional antibody response. So not just measure the response in the previous uh, 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 result I showed you. This was an ELISA response, which measures the quantity of antibodies that is produced uh, by the immunization, by the vaccine. But that doesn't mean the, the antibodies actually do or can do anything. In that particular case, we can measure the functional antibody response, which means the capacity of the antibodies to kill the bacteria in, in, uh, in culture. And this is for, for meningococcus, a surrogate of protection used for licensure. And here with the red arrow, I, mentioned, I, I highlight uh, the vaccine with the gun. Uh, you have uh, several controls on the left and the right, the vaccine subcutaneously and intramuscular, and here uh, uh, with the alum after the two doses. And you can see that basically the needle-free in our uh, hands and use similar uh, functional antibody titers as compared to any of the uh, traditional injection routes. I want to mention, uh, before I finish, two other successes uh, with the uh, uh, ballistic injection, a phase one clinical trial with the flu uh, published in 2006 with a DNA vaccine, a flu DNA vaccine, which uh, achieved uh, uh, the, the criteria for required for lic licensure in, in human using a powder jet gun. Um, and also uh, Hep B, a bit older, uh, uh, that also showed a DNA vaccine immunogenicity in uh, humans. So to conclude really, uh, and, and because the, the, the series of talk is a bit of what can we expect and what would be the impact on, on, the, on, on the population. As I said in the beginning, the aim for new vaccine technology are, are to be cheap, uh, low cost per dose, low cost per, for transport, so sufficient stability during transport and storage without refrigeration. They should be safe. The injection device should be safe for the healthcare provider and for the vaccinee, potentially pain free, that's a benefit. Ease of disposal, I mean, if you have a massive uh, device, it, it can also be a, quite a cost to dispose of it. And potentially, the injection may not require trained medical professional uh, uh, personnel. And that has an advantage and also raises some ethical questions and, and that you can all imagine. The advantage is, uh, for example, the patch, you, you, you deliver, you don't need medical personnel in developing countries that could be really good. You just give the patch, people put it on themselves. Now, there's difficulty, obviously. Will, will they do it? Will they not do it? How do you then measure the, uh, the, the coverage of the vaccination in a population when you actually delivered the vaccine, but not vaccinated the people? What do you take as a, as a real coverage or not? And these are questions that, that could be raised by, by the potential of self-immunization, which is in common with the micro, uh, microneedle patch. So for bi ballistic injection and microneedle patch, I assume you understood that probably my, my favorite uh, at the moment. Uh, the cost of the equipment is higher. I think there's no hiding from that. Um, however, it could be balanced in real life with a lower cost for the cold chain, a lower uh, uh, cost because of the loss in transport by the free flow. And, uh, uh, in, sometimes it was reported, I think, by the, the, by the WHO that 50% of vaccine can be lost during transport, not so much because they lose the cold storage, but because they get frozen accidentally and then thawed. And that just kills a vaccine. That wouldn't happen with a thermostable dry particle. I did mention, uh, and uh, I want to mention that example, cold storage in developing countries is not a straightforward issue. And uh, this example was uh, given to me by uh, um, Andrew Pollard, actually, in, in, uh, in Africa, in, in, I think it was the Gambia, and I might be wrong on that one. Um, the, the, the vaccine is provided for free, the pneumococcus vaccine is provided for free, and they could provide uh, PCV7 or PCV13. PCV13 covering uh, th 13 serotype when PCV7 covers only seven. So PCV13 could be uh, considered better. And actually, they could not take PCV13 because the packaging is so big that they didn't have the capacity to store the vaccine in fridges. So that just to illustrate the uh, importance of the packaging of the vaccine uh, uh, in, in its use. Uh, stability extended over longer times would be good. The dry storage requires, uh, the, so the powdered requires dry storage. So uh, the enemy of a, of a dried vaccine is not temperature change, it's water. I assume pa Pawan might mention it. So you have to devise a system to protect it from water, which actually I think is not as difficult as a cold chain. I mean, a sealed pouch, 
uh, can, can do it. Yeah, and then that's it. Uh, just wanting to mention the cost, the vaccine development, it's cost a lot of money and a lot of time. So from the concept to, to preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, that is 10, 15 years, sometimes 20 years, for, for example, for the MENDI vaccine, 20 years, enormous amount of money, enormous amount of time. Then at, already at that stage, you have worked out your large scale production and your plans. So any new vaccine is an enormous investment in time and money from private companies or, or, or whoever is, is ready for, for paying for, 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 for it. And then I want to have another view, but my personal view is that all these new technologies, even though we prove now that they work, actually I doubt that they will be um, used for existing vaccines because of all this work already done, the cost, it, the cost and the time it takes. So I think these new technology will really only reach real life for new vaccines because then they will be incorporated from the start and incorporating in the production line and the plans. And that will be my, my concluded remark and just want to thank collaborators, uh, Nicola Weissmuller, he, the, all this work was his DPhil, basically he's now in Princeton and we keep uh, working on nanoparticles. Christina Dolph who's here, uh, uh, Leanne Massey and Andrew Pollard, our beloved uh, boss, and then the IBM -E, uh, a Heiko Shifter who, who left for Germany and, and Robert Carlyle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine, for that reference to the importance of thermostable vaccines that I'll be talking in this short presentation. Um, uh, Needle-free vaccines is definitely, um, would be of great importance for uh, patient compliance and wider uh, coverage of the vaccines. But we will see how we, uh, we reach, whether we reach or not uh, for needle-free vaccines. Uh, but I hope we do. Um, I am Pawan Dulal. Uh, it depends on how you pronounce it, whether in British accent or in American accent, it's Pawan or Pawan. Um, and I work at the Jenner Institute uh, in vaccine formulation and thermal stability. Uh, I've been working there from 2012. So basically, we try to uh, stabilize vaccines, um, uh, especially for the developing world. Jenner uh, being involved in the, uh, the research of um, uh, vaccines important to the developing world, uh, it would be of importance to have the vaccines um, thermostable in the beginning. And thank you for inviting me uh, to this talk. Um, in, in the talk, I will be covering a brief introduction to what I do uh, and brief introduction to when we started um, uh, storing and preserving biomolecules and uh, uh, cells of um, biomedical importance. Um, and I'll briefly introduce to you to uh, the project that I'm involved in. Um, before that, I have to start my slides. Uh, just a moment. Yes, so, so I would, before talking anything, I would like to give you a few facts regarding the vaccines. So current status of vaccines, we have been fortunate that we've got more than 250 vaccines uh, against 29, 28, 29 diseases, infectious diseases. That's not all, but at least we've got them. And more, 100, around more than 100 vaccines are on pipeline for um, uh, uh, introduction to the market. Talking about vaccine stability, because I will be later talking about vaccine thermostability and the importance of thermostability, only 9% of the vaccine proportionately are uh, stable up to 25 degrees Celsius for a week. And 9% of them are stable up to 37 degrees for a week. And only 4% of them are stable uh, more than 37 degrees Celsius for a week. And all of these vaccines have to be transported in a refrigerated condition from the day they are manufactured until the last leg and until a person gets vaccinate, uh, vaccinated. All there is, uh, uh, the data is based on a report published by an organization called PATH in 2012. By then, uh, by now, the number of vaccines have 
already increased. So how about we have to bring the context of the vaccine market as well. So WHO estimates that the global vaccine market in 2012, 2013 was around 20 billion US dollars. And it is estimated to be more than $100, $100 billion dollars um, by 2025, it's a huge market. And cold chain, which is the chain of refrigeration required for the transportation of the vaccines, costs around 80% of the total cost. It, the data is rather old from 2000, and the cost has gone down because the cost of the vaccine production and the introduction of the vaccine, the cost of production of new vaccine has gone up. So the percentage of cold chain is slightly lower. So we have to have a perception of how the vaccines would be transported. So these are the two pictures that depict what conditions the vaccine has to undergo. Um, so the, the picture on the left is, um, are the porters in Nepal somewhere? Um, in Mustang district, um, Mustang, a, a one of the remote areas uh, of Nepal where they are carrying their vaccine in cold packs uh, at their backs and during the journey that um, a vaccine has to go through, they, since they are um, not thermostabilized, they can undergo degradation, aggregation, hydrolysis, because they are present in the um, uh, water. And you are right, Christine, uh, water is a villain in, in vaccine, liquid vaccines, and other, other chemical uh, processes uh, uh, for degradation. And that renders the vaccine unusable uh, and less efficient as well. So the the, the only solution could be thermostable vaccines. So having thermostable vaccine will remove the, the loss due to cold chain breakers. So the context is when the cold chain is broken, when a vaccine is briefly um, exposed to high temperature in somewhere in the tarmac of the airports or somewhere, the vaccine brief exposure to uh, the higher temp to higher temperature leaves vaccine if inefficient. There has been other methods of detecting when it happens, but that is not enough to protect the vaccines. Um, and, and, and not only high temperature, vaccine can be destabilized or uh, rendered uh, useless when they are exposed to uh, freezing temperature as well. Vaccines, it's, it's a two-edged sword when um, it, it cannot tolerate higher temperature or lower temperature. And the other context is vaccines such as herpes joster uh, cannot be stored and transported in uh, at four degree. They, they have to be frozen. So that intensified the complexity of already complex uh, cold chain. So we have a success story of thermostable vaccine. Men Afrivac is a vaccine that was recently introduced in Africa, and that's the first uh, thermostable vaccine approved by FDA for its use in Africa. And that, the re results from that suggest that 15% uh, of the administrative burden was, could be reduced by introducing that vaccine, and 79% of the cold chain cost was reduced. And it's worth mentioning here that smallpox and the rinderpest, the only two diseases that we have been able to eradicate from the world, the vaccines used for those two diseases were highly thermostable. And hence the coverage was uh, appropriate. So before going to uh, detail of how um, how to thermostabilize vaccine and our approaches, I think it would be worth mentioning uh, when we started and how it was started to stabilize and preserve any biomolecules. So na in nature, there are organisms, plants and organisms such as uh, resurrection plant, the plant on the left, the, the image shows that uh, a resurrection plant which can survive desiccation in desert condition for years. Uh, and when it gets water, it comes back to life. Uh, this is a picture of uh, with a time lapse picture of three hours when water was introduced to resurrection plant. And the other picture on the right, uh, on the on your right, yes, um, is tardigrade, tardigrade, which is water beer, and it can uh, tolerate uh, quite extreme conditions. And it um, it desiccates and can um, uh, it can be exposed to, or it, it remains viable when it uh, receives water. So 
the NATO had shown us, NATO had solved the problem, but it took us quite a long research. Um, uh, I find research on um, approaches to preserve vaccines, um, not, not vaccines, but biomolecules and cells uh, from 1920s, but the success only happened in 1949 when a group in London uh, managed to accidentally drop glycerol into spermatozoa of uh, fowl, uh, and then the revival of spermatozoa they found was um, higher, and then hence that kicked off all the research, and then the year following they managed to uh, uh, stabilize uh, or preserve red blood cells for probably for um, uh, infusion purposes. And it took until 1970s when a group showed um, that organisms which were tolerant to desiccation actually accumulated sugars like trihalose and glycerol, uh, and they were able to, during the process of desiccation, and they were able to tolerate uh, the uh, desiccation and the stress related to desiccation. And the same group later started using, exploiting this um, uh, phenomenon, and then they lyophilize proteins of commercial values, and hence the lyophilization process all started for commercial purposes. So after that, we found that lots of groups have found other excipients. These are buffering agents, amino acids, osmolites, sugars, carbohydrates, proteins, salts, chelators, antioxidants, and they have mixed these uh, in different proportion in high throughput, uh, high throughput uh, way to find out best combination of these excipients to find uh, to to stabilize the vaccines in liquid as well as lyophilized form. And lyophilization is freeze drying where a product is frozen uh, rapidly and the water removed out of it in a vacuum condition. And spray drying and vacuum drying, I think the, the nice particle you showed were uh, used from spray drying. Um, I think spray freeze drying was the method as long as I remember uh, talking to Nick. Um, so these are the methods that are used for um, generating dry products. So the problem, with, the problem with general approaches is the liquid formats are less stable because they are exposed to environmental stress of pH, high temperature, freezing temperature, anything that is available in the environment. And the options and the most common method of uh, removing water in biopharma and the pharmaceutical industries is lyophilization. And, but it is an expensive method, lengthy process, and it is detrimental because the, the product is frozen at low temperature before it can be dried out. So vaccines such as alum adsumative vaccines such as hep, hepatitis B vaccine that contains alum um, cannot be um, uh, used there, although there has been methods uh, developed, but such vaccines cannot be made thermostable or, or dried uh, using lyophilization. And more importantly, it doesn't guarantee thermostability of vaccines. All the vaccines, although they are lyophilized, have to be stored at, in the cold chain in the refrigerated temperatures. So our strategy is slightly different, less expensive, so what was developed in 2010 um, by the Jenner Institute and a collaborator, they used a fibrous, non-woven fibrous matrix where they formulated a vaccine and in, in simple sugar and loaded the vaccine into the membranes. The vaccine, when loaded, because of the properties, specific properties of the membranes, the vaccine would uh, abruptly get absorbed into the membrane and the desiccation happened at low relative humidity Two minutes, okay. Um, low relative humidity, and it would give a highly, uh, it, it gives a thin, ultra thin membrane, ultra thin layer of vaccine formulated um, a dry, dry film, which is easily uh, dissolvable into um, a buffer when you want to vaccinate anyone. So the advantages of the techno technology is it's a simple technique, generic drying protocol unlike lyophilization where a, a, each product has to be custom um, um, uh, optimized for the lyophilization cycle. Simple sugars were used, instantaneous solution, solubility of the vaccine, and uh, the, 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 solubility, uh, the stability of the sugar glass itself that is formed uh, like uh, the, uh, like in the picture, is quite stable, up to 57, 57 degrees Celsius. Uh, quicker processing time, more importantly, stable 
vaccines. So this, uh, I'm showing you, um, uh, it, it has been submitted, the manuscript has been submitted. We have recently tested a Rift Valley fever vaccine. Rift Valley is one of the diseases in Africa and so, um, so Arabian Peninsula uh, for the disease of cattle where uh, the vaccine was developed at the Jenner Institute. So we dried and um, um, uh, dried the vaccine into the membrane and tested the infectivity of the vaccine where you can see in, I don't know whether you can see my cursor or not. Uh, yes, so the vaccines were um, dried and tested after a week, uh, one month and six months at different um, temperatures, which are minus 80, 25, 37, 45, and 55. You can see at temperatures of 55, um, we hope that nobody will expose a vaccine at 55 degrees Celsius, but it goes down, but at 45 to 45 degree, there was not significant difference between the minus 80 stored vaccine um, and um, um, minus 80 and 45 degrees Celsius. Compare that to one week of liquid stored vaccine where the stability of 37, 45 and uh, 55 goes down below the detection level. And these vaccines after six months were used for immunization to uh, cattle um, and we found that uh, the immunogenicity of these vaccines were uh, comparable to, uh, there was no significant difference between minus 80 stored and this vaccine stored at different temperatures except for 55 degrees Celsius. And we looked at the um, expression of the protein. The, the vaccine was uh, recombinant um, a viral vaccine, viral vector vaccine, and we had to look at the expression of the proteins in, uh, in, in when they infected cells. So uh, it was uh, the pr pr express, uh, the protein, recombinant protein was expressed. We have wor also worked on several different vaccines, both commercially available as well as in um, uh, experimental vaccine at the Jenner uh, ad five. These are published research on. Uh, um, this is adenoviral, uh, this is modified vaccine, vaccine virus, human papilloma virus vaccines, um, this is commercially available vaccine, was stable up to 70 degree and 60% of it was uh, um, recoverable. Hepatitis B vaccine was stable up to seven weeks at 40, 55 degrees Celsius. Similarly, RNA viral va vaccine, I, I'm afraid I can't mention what the vaccine was due to the C confidentiality agreement with the company we worked for. And liposome vaccine, liposomes are new, um, newly um, developed uh, adjuvants, uh, and we wanted to see whether we could stabilize liposomes or not, and but similarly, baculovirus. And the current projects I'm involved in, we're looking at stabilizing Newcastle disease vaccine, which is of massive importance economically in the developing world because the vaccine currently available comes in the dose of 500 to 1,000 uh, doses per vial to save the space in the cold chain. Um, and it's fine for the big poultry farmers, but for the farmers who have five to 10 chicken uh, in a flock in their backyard, uh, they can't afford the vaccine. And, and if they do, they can't, the, the vaccine, once it is reconstituted, cannot be used after half an hour. So our aim in the project, this is BBSRC funded project, is to reduce the dose and thermostabilize the vaccine and hope to uh, take the vaccine out of the cold chain altogether so that it can be transported without the cold chain. And we're working on GMP production of thermostabilized vaccine uh, using the technology. If we want to take it to the human use, we have to optimize the process, whether it is good, uh, produced under good manufacturing practice or not. So we're using rabies, experimentally rabies vaccine, uh, and we'll be testing it. And for the Del we are also working uh, with a big um, uh, company that makes um, uh, delivery devices. These two devices were already published um, that were proposed, but we have been working with another company to uh, design a device. They have already done it. I'm afraid I, I, I probably will be able to show you the design uh, when uh, in, in my next opportunity to talk here. Um, so challenges and way forward, as Christine said, the utilization of this new technology will be tricky because uh, the big biopharma will be reluctant to adopt these technology as they are uh, because they will have to either scrap all of their methods that they have been using for years and it will be a lot of cost. But what we can argue here is if we show that the vaccines are, can be made stable, we're using all the vaccines in routine immunization, these are licensed vaccines, can be made, shown that they can be made stable, we can 
argue in uh, 10 years down the line that these technologies will be worth um, to adopt in massive uh, uh, vaccine production. So, and, and also to, to pave our path uh, for the future, we are, we are already adopting the technology for the newly designed vaccine because um, there's a new, new, new vaccine that are being de uh, designed at the Jenner, so we have adopted them. So hopefully, if these va vaccines ever get licensed, we will uh, have used and have the regulatory approval for these vaccines right from the beginning. I would like to thank all of you for listening and thank my uh, boss, Adrian Hill, Rebecca Ashfield, Adam Walters, and uh, my supervisor in um, uh, IB Institute of Biomedical Engineering, and um, all of you. Thank you very much. Okay. okay, we've got a uh, little time for some questions. Do you want to, Christine, to come up? Um, I should just warn you, this is being live webcast, so if you're uncomfortable with that, um, don't ask a question. <laughs> and for the same reason, please wait for the microphone to get to you so that your voice can be heard on, on the webcast. So do we have any questions for either speaker? Ah, okay, someone's tweeted a question. And I should have said the, the, the candle in 2004, that's what they did. They got uh, uh, sk human skin tissue um, from, uh, you know, um, uh, dermatome cancer um, mm -hmm. uh, excisions, got the healthy part that has to be taken around. And that study where they studied the, the thickness, the velocity, etc., was all on human skin. Ex vivo, but, but uh, admittedly, and it may change a bit the, the, the reaction, but it's all on human skin. So yes, very good point. That's, that's a way to, to really standardize and, and optimize the technology. Absolutely. Any other questions? I had a question on funding, um, where that's it's going. <laughs> no, because you showed your slide, which is very interesting, on the, you know, the, the length of time, this 15-year horizon. Um, and you talked a lot about the clear uh, you know, savings that are there. Are people putting, I mean, it, you know, going forward, do you have a lot of their major funders in this area of, of it's, development? It's very funny you, you, ma you mentioned that. We, we got uh, funded by the Oxford Martin School on, on a relatively uh, modest funding. That, yeah, yeah. that sort of work doesn't cost so much in a preclinical, I assume the same for power. Yeah, yeah. But even the Oxford Martin didn't fund it further. So, yeah. so <laughs> that's an appeal. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> that's an appeal, actually. But the major funders no. that you showed so, on your slide. So no, the major funders that these are the ones that we work uh, at, uh, mm. in the pediatric department at Oxford Vaccine Group for other uh, vaccine developments that don't necessarily uh, have uh, that technology. Uh, these are the funders that will. Uh, I wanted to indicate which one would cover the preclinical MRC mm. Welcome mm -hmm. Trust or the charities yeah. uh, a lot, and which one then cover uh, phase two. Potentially, you still have MRC Welcome Trust. Phase three, you need you need your your. Uh, pharmaceutical company, it's yes. too expensive, mm. that's yes. it. Yeah. And by then, the, the, the plan, the, the large production is already worked out. So the funding is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and for our project, is, a, is very much a difficulty. Mm. Yes. Uh, there's not much investment in that area. Yeah, I think we, uh, the research councils are basically the funders for the initial work, and at some point, you have to have big biopharmaceutical company on board mm. um, to, to take it for ahead. It's, uh, it's, it's huge cost, especially for a regulatory, um, and, and you have to do mm. lots of tests as well. So um, yeah, you have to have someone with a lot of money. Mm. Yeah. And it's difficult. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? There's one here. Vax 
vaccine or a fiber matrix, how is that actually administered to the patient? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't mention. So um, one job will be, I'll, I'll have to show you my picture um, of the delivery device. And uh, so what will happen in this design, uh, if I do it, uh, so the idea, the theory was for this design uh, to be uh, designed, um, the buffer, the, since the vaccine would be dried on this membrane, so the membrane would be packaged in this cassette. And when you draw the, vac the buffer through the needle from here, it would go through, reconstitute the vaccine that has been dried into the syringe and you change the needle and then immunize the, um, uh, the person. Or the other way was have the syringe filled with uh, the buffer and then in, while you are in immunizing someone, the, the buffer would go through the membrane, take all the vaccine into it, and then the person would be immunized at the other end. So uh, we have come up with a different uh, design, uh, which I couldn't show you today, but it will avoid uh, any disadvantages this de device might have, uh, and it will be more efficient. But it has to go through uh, the reconstitution uh, during the delivery. been talking about vaccines um, is there anybody looking at new ways of delivering say insulin for diabetic people yes definitely and uh, there's the, the liquid injector and it's actually in use and uh, I believe in the US so you, you can buy it it's, it's, it's been delivering so there is so, some pain and, and it depends uh, some people prefer the, the, the injection uh, some people prefer the liquid jet um, no no it's, it's definitely already and also for the growth hormone so um, yeah. So, so this technology, the liquid jet, definitely is already used. Yeah. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, just before we thank our speakers again, I just, this was the sixth in a series of eight talks um, uh, on technology for tomorrow. I just want to draw your attention to the next two. Um, five o'clock in this room uh, next Thursday, we have the topical driverless vehicles navigating autonomous future, Dr. Ingmar Posner um, from Information Engineering. And on the 10th of March, the uh, broad challenge um, Professor Don Farmer is taking on. He, he runs the Complexity Economics Program, but he's going to be talking about predicting technological progress and ways in which that might be done. So you're all very welcome to come to those. And maybe we could just conclude with uh, one final round of applause for our speakers.